Well, welcome back to Betty and Reith, and we've got Senator David Lineholm with us tonight. David, it's great to have you. You're a libertarian. You're, you represent a very strong view in the Senate. We're delighted to have you here. Peter's got the first question. Well, he's a Liberal Democrat, you've got to say that. Mm. And, uh, I and thought, a libertarian. I thought you'd be interested to hear that. Actually, I was speaking to a very uh, one of the up-and-comers in uh, Victoria, and um, I said to her, what do you think of that David Lineholm? And she said, oh, He's the one that we all like. It's just that we can't say it. <laughs> so, a liberal uh, mate of mine said he's the only liberal in the federal parliament. <laughs> oh, that's a, that, is a, that is a bit rough, I'd have to say. Don't you say something like that. Well, I think but, he'd agree with me. Uh, but, <laughs> Might be true. Yeah. Well, tell us what it's all about being a liberal Democrat, and uh, then we can talk something basic like, will you get back in again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and whether it did, was, it, was it up to us? Yeah, well... Um, we, we, as you said, we're a libertarian party, and that means we, we think the government should be relatively small. So low taxes, uh, economic interference in, <coughs> in business and, and our taxes and all that sort of stuff should be minimal. Uh, not zero, because that's anarchist, but, but not too much. Um, and then in our social lives, if you're not hurting anybody else, it's none of the government's business. So you don't have to approve, you don't have to want to do it yourself, you don't have to recommend it, but if it's not hurting anybody else, it's not the government's business and, and technically it's not yours either. Unless it happens to be your son or your daughter and you, you want to wag the finger at them, that's okay. But it's not a, bit, not a matter for the government. So libertarians are, uh, confuse people who want to categorise things as left-wing or right-wing. If you believe in marijuana legalisation, for example, which I do, not because I smoke marijuana, not because I think it's good, not because I recommend it, because I simply think it's none of the government's business, um, then I'm categorised as left-wing. If I believe in low taxes and less regulation of, of um, uh, business and market solutions, I'm regarded as right-wing. So people who think in left-right terms have a great deal of trouble with libertarians. But once you get used to the idea that there's a limited role for the government, and it shouldn't go beyond that role, that's when you understand what a libertarian is. David, let's talk about, and thank you for that, let's talk about the Senate and what's going to happen. I mean, mm -hmm. this election campaign will focus on the lower house, but really, the Senate, with the crossbench, uh, it, no, no major party is going to end up with control. So we really want to find out what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You're, you got 9.5% of the primary vote last time. People talk about the tiny percentages. You weren't one of them. Mm -hmm. So... Tell me what you think the reforms to the Senate are going to mean for you, for your chances of getting re-elected, and how do people actually vote? There's a new system, so maybe you can educate as well as explain what you think your chances are and what's going to happen. Well, the change is that instead of the parties directing where your preferences go, the voter directs where your preferences go. The, there is a, a risk to that, though, in that for the voter who doesn't vote for a party that has a chance of winning, your vote might actually exhaust. So that, that's a major objection. But um, what it's also changed is, is the ease with which a minor party can get elected to the Senate. In the past, as we saw with Ricky Muir, it was a fluke. It's the first time it's ever happened in 30 years or something. But Mick, Ricky Muir got elected on half a percent. Um, the, there's no previous example of that. So, you know, I think there was a bit of an overreaction to it. But still, that's what happens when the parties exchange preferences amongst themselves. The new system means that um, you'll have to get a sufficient primary vote um, to stay in the count. And then, assuming the, the voters actually do allocate preferences, and it'll be up to the voters on their voting tickets, then they'll start allocating voters to uh, the preferences of those that drop out the bottom. Now, um, in a normal half Senate election, the, <coughs> the quota is 14.3 per cent. But um, the sixth position, so normally six seats are to be filled in each state, the sixth position would be filled on less than a quota and typically that would be somewhere between 7 and 10 per cent would be enough. In a double dissolution election, that's halved. The, the, the official, the proper quota is 7.7 per cent, but the amount that you require to actually get elected is half that. Or less than that. So based but, on last time's figure, if you got that again, you will get re-elected? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I would have been easily elected on that. Um, in fact, we, we had a look at the 2013 election results um, on the basis that what, what would the result have been if it had been a double dissolution and the new voting system had applied. And there actually would have been more crossbench senators elected. And you would have needed somewhere between 3 and 5% of the vote to get elected. 
Cato Australia Party would have won a seat in Queensland on less than 3 per cent of the vote. Now, it, it's, 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 a, it's a little bit complicated, but basically it's, it's the last man standing, last woman standing, with the highest remainder is what it works, uh, how it works out. Now, uh, assuming that there are a number of parties that can get 3 to 5 per cent primary vote, and I think that's, that's entirely doable, and then pick up a few preferences, they'll be in. And, and there's a very good chance that the 11th and the 12th position in each state will be filled by a minor party. Now, at the moment, we've so we'll end up with more more crossbench. Crossbench. And, than and will you now. be in that group, um, or is that a matter of where the numbers or the uh, yeah? Well, it's not parties. guaranteed. Right. Um, okay. I, I'm not like being number one on the Labor ticket or the Liberal time. ticket, which is a certainty. Yeah. But yes, there's a very good chance. I got nine and a half percent, even if. Um, I benefited a lot from being number one on the ticket, mm. so you'd assume that that, that might be 2%. Um, that's what the donkey vote is allegedly worth. Even if um, there were people who voted for me and my party because of the word liberal mm. in, it, in the name, well, that'll still be there. Mm. It won't have changed. There'll be logos, but the word liberal will still be there. So even if that was a factor, it'll still be a factor. So will Ricky Muir make it? I don't think he will. He's, done, he's a good good senator, he's a good young fella, and he's really improved out of sight as a senator. He would, it's a shame because he, he would be a great senator, but we've only been there two years, yeah. and to build his vote from half a percent to three, four, five percent in two years is a bit... A bit and what, what about Jackie Lambie? Is she, uh, is she that's, such... Uh, that's a is she one. so loved in Tasmania that they'll all vote for her, or right. is it the completely opposite? <laughs> Where is she in I, that in that? Yeah, I find spectrum. that hard to predict. Um, yeah. we're, we're wondering that too. There's all these predictions that she'll get back in, but no data. No data at yeah. all. No research. No is research. there anybody else that you think is likely to go out? Go out, yes. Glenn um, Lazarus? Um, I think Glenn Lazarus will struggle. In Queensland, he'll be competing... With uh, well, Clive will probably run. He hasn't announced it, but I think he would probably he will run. Yeah. But his vote will be dissipated compared he to what will, it was last time. But I reckon he and Lazarus will be competing for the same sort of um, uh, people. Pauline Hanson will be running, and she's kind of in that. And that could as be well. the last fight, Pauline Hanson or Lazarus or, or Clive Palmer, yeah. couldn't it? Yeah. And, and Bob Catter's party will also be running. Now, if you sort of think about what kind of voters would, would vote for those. They're sort of the same people, so there's a very good chance they might split that vote. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm not sure about Lazarus. Lambie is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, he's, she's very popular. She's actually very well known. Mm -hmm. Whether that translates into votes is an entirely no. different matter. I think Bob Day will get back in um, South Australia. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that Dio Wang will get back in, in WA. He's, he's still going to run under the Palmer mm -hmm. banner. And Nick Xenophon. Nick Xenophon. Well, he's got uh, very strong support in South Australia, not much support outside as far as we can tell. Um, and if he repeats the vote of last time, he'll probably get three up. And do you reckon any of his will be any good? I mean, it's one thing for him. He's a good operator, obviously, but, I mean, sometimes, like as it happened with the uh, Clive Palmer, yeah. you get the dregs sometimes. Yes. I don't know. I mean, Nick... That's a political term, of course. Well, yeah, yeah it's a no, but Nick's no fool, but, I mean, yeah. I mean, there was one candidate that I saw just a, you know, a few comments on them, and I thought, gee, I think he could, could have done better than that. Yes. Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, Nick is a good politician, a good retail politician. Mm. Uh, he's so good, in fact, that not very many people realise he votes for the Greens most of the time. Most mm. people think he's such a nice fella, mm. jumps on the issues. <coughs> he must be across everything. But his voting record shows his sympathies lie primarily with the Greens. So the, the quest but the question is, will he be able to build a team? He is a pretty much a lone ranger. Yeah. He does his own thing. His, his staff... Uh, race like crazy to keep up with him. Yeah. Now, um, his history in the South Australian Parliament, because he was in there for 10 years, I think, was when he got somebody elected in on his popularity, he fell out with that, that person. No, woman. Right. Right. They went their own ways. Oh, okay. So, quite, president, bitter, quite bitter too. Yeah, mm. that's right. They were quite angry. Um, so, President would suggest that, uh, you know, he's not a team player. That he may have learnt from that, you know, I may be doing him an injustice. He's Can a I, nice guy, he's so very nice David, guy. David, based on what you're saying, in relation to what Peter asked, basically you're saying we could end up with 12 on the cross bench in addition to Labor, Liberal and the Greens. That's, that's the max. well, I think the maximum possible would be 12 on the cross bench plus 3 Xenophon. 
Right. That's, a, that's the maximum. Now, realistically, that's probably not going to happen. But it could easily be seven or eight plus... plus we're going to hold you to this, you know. Yeah. We're going to get you back. We're, we're going to talk to you on the night, exactly, <laughs> if nothing else. David, one thing that really, I think, you, is, is important to answer, and we'll give you an opportunity to do that. Both sides of politics. The Labor Party have complained about it. The Liberal National Party have complained about the crossbench and all the rest of it. There's the argument, of course, that says, well, look, the Senate is there to keep the executive accountable. Mm. What do you say to those people who say, well, look, this crossbench, it's difficult to deal with, they've blocked the government? I mean, I'm talking generally. I mean, I understand your voting pattern. You, you're actually one of the clear people about what your views are. No one can say you're, you're confused or anyone's confused mm. about your position. Okay. So how, how do you respond to that? What's your answer when people put that question? Well, the, the history of the Senate is that it's very rarely been controlled by the government. It's always been a matter for negotiation. The difference is that instead of just negotiating with Labor and the Greens, um, and perhaps Xenophon in the past, and, um, um, or if Labor was in power, they've had to vote with the government, and uh, a vote with the Liberals, Nationals and, and the Greens and, um, and get, get the majority, and quite often have had struggled to do that. Uh, they've had to negotiate with... Um, eight of us ferals. Now, um, the, the fact is the government has shown itself to be very bad at it. They really are um, just not comfortable dealing with uh, a diverse group of people like that. And the Labor Party laughed at them, um, quite frankly. They, they said, look, when Gillard was the Prime Minister, she didn't have a majority in the House of Reps. She had to deal with the crossbench there. She schmoozed them. She cultivated but they were them. Labor as well, mate. Let's yeah. face it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there were, there were differences. I acknowledge that. But, um, but she got her stuff through the House um, w with a crossbench that could have gone negative. Now, if you actually look at the eight uh, crossbenches that the Abbott and then Turnbull government have had to deal with, Lazarus, Lambie, Madigan and Muir are Labor-oriented. And once you understand that, you understand where they're coming from. Xenophon, uh, Greens-oriented. Uh, myself, Bob Day, D.O. Wang, uh, liberal-oriented. Bob in particular, uh, D.O. and I, you know, majority uh, liberal-oriented. So, and once you understand that, then you understand why the government's had so much difficulty. If, we, if they replaced us crossbenchers with government, Greens and Labor senators, the outcome would have been no different, except that they, the government would have found it um, getting a knockback from just a representative of Labor, Greens, um, would have had the same outcome, but there wouldn't have been the doubt about it. It would have been just, no, go away, that's the end of the discussion. Whereas in, in our case, they, did, they found out Labor and the Greens were opposed, then they had to try and find six out of the eight of us to get a majority. And they were terrible at it. They were frankly terrible at it. Individually, they're nice people. I have no complaints about them as people. But in terms of negotiating relationship development, um, they were appalling. It was just pure transaction. Can I have... Can I sit down and explain to you why you should vote for my bill? Um, OK, now I've got your agreement, now I'm gone again, that's the end of it. And it's just pure transactional dealing. And there were many times when even, even I didn't care two hoots which way it went. And I was sort of thinking, well, give me a reason why I should support this. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just give me something. Something, something and, to do. And, you know, they didn't understand yeah. that. They just want to keep telling me how good their bill was. Well, David, we're going to hold you to that count, as Peter said. Yeah. We're, we're going to get you back after the election, and we're going to say to you, well, David, you said this was the do. outcome. We're, we're going to see how it goes. David, thank you for coming in, Thanks, and all the best. Thank we you really very much. appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. We're going to uh, have a short break, and we'll be back with Professor Ross Fitzgerald.